Good evening and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for this important discussion focused on methane emission reduction opportunities um, in the United States and China, with a focus on actions that we can be taking within this decade. I'm Louise Bedsworth. I'm Executive Director of the Center for Law, Energy, and Environment at Berkeley Law, and will be serving as the moderator for today's discussion. Uh, before we uh, get started, I want to start with a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, first, we are recording this event, and the recording will be available on the CCCI website and YouTube channel uh, uh, shortly after the event. This event is being simultaneously translated into Mandarin Chinese. Uh, please use the globe icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen and select the preferred language that you would like to be listening in. Throughout today's discussion, uh, if you would like to ask a question, you please use the question and answer function within the Zoom webinar. Uh, and so if you can place your question in there and we will um, have an opportunity to, to have questions from the audience and we will do our best to answer as many questions as possible uh, during today's event. Um, so with that, let's get started. Uh, today's program is one as part of a larger series that we've been uh, hosting to explore and exploring at the California China Climate Institute. And we're focusing in on opportunities for collaborative action uh, between the US and China uh, to tackle and undertake climate action within this decade. And we've been looking under the sectoral topics outlined in the Glasgow Declaration signed at COP26. Uh, in association, we launched an 11 paper series that focused on each of these sectors. And so today we will be focusing in on one of those methane emission reductions. As two of the largest global economies and uh, energy consumers, China and the US are also the top, uh, sorry, are also the top uh, methane emitters as well. Both nations have significant opportunities to reduce their methane emissions over the next decades, with some methods of reduction having low or very few costs associated with them. And so today we're going to hear from issue area experts sharing insights from a recent report called Reducing Methane Emissions in the U.S. and China. To get started, I now have the opportunity to introduce Dr. Jiang Lin to offer some opening remarks. Uh, Dr. Lin is the Nat Simons Pre Presidential Chair in China Energy Policy at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, a staff scientist in its Department of Electricity Market and Policy, and an adjunct professor at the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics at the University of California, Berkeley. Dr. Lin's research is focused on energy and climate policy, energy and emissions pathways with a focus on non-CO2 uh, emissions such as methane, F gases, and, and others. Electricity market and planning and low carbon economic transition and appliance energy er, efficiency issues in China. It's so obviously a wealth of knowledge and experience here. So I turn it over to you, uh, Dr. Lin. Well, thank you, Louise, for that nice introduction. Uh, good morning to our participants in China and good evening to our friends in the U.S. As many of you uh, know, methane is a short-lived climate uh, pollutant with more than 80 percent, uh, 80 times the warming impact of carbon dioxide over the 20 years period. Thus, reducing methane emission is considered critical in limiting temperature rise in the near term. Methane is already responsible for up to 30% today's anthropogenic global warming. So taking targeted action to reduce methane could avoid nearly 0.3 Celsius of global warming by 2040s. And that's providing more time for us to adopt more ambitious target to reducing carbon emissions. In the near term, measure that reduce methane can cut warming more significantly than those reducing CO2 emissions, and up to three times more effective. Globally, roughly 150 countries uh, have signed and joined the Global Methane Pledge uh, with the goal of reducing 30% of global methane emission by 2030. The U.S. and China has also affirmed their commitment to reducing methane emission in their joint Glasgow Declaration on Enhanced Climate Action in the 2020s. 
in the in this in terms of the source emission, the U.S. and China have quite different compositions. You know, for example, in the U.S., oil and gas is the majority of the methane emission in the energy sector. Well, in China, coal mine methane is a leading source. In agriculture, U.S. emission is dominated by enteric fermentation. Well, in China, rice cultivation accounts for a much larger proportion. Both U.S. and China has made a significant effort in the recent years uh, in, reading, in reducing their respective methane emission. However, despite the progress made so far, both countries, as two largest emitters of greenhouse gas and the two largest economy in the world, have much to do to enhance their action on climate change and reducing methane emission, including setting ambitious mitigation target and regulations, developing incentives, investing in innovation, strengthening MRV systems, and finding more opportunity to collaborate both at the national and subnational level. For example, cities in you know, both countries have to reduce their waste sector methane emission and improve, in improving air quality. In agriculture, both countries have to invest in new technologies to reducing um, emissions from animals, including feed additives and biochar. And in energy sector, the US has to deal with abandoned oil and gas wells, and in China has to deal with uh, abandoned coal mines as well. So I hope uh, today's webinar serve as a useful forum to create more constructive discussions on solutions that can towards such common goals in terms of reducing methane emissions. Now I'm going to turn over to my colleagues for the next uh, to discuss the paper we uh, wrote about this topic. Thank you so much, Young. Um, and now I do have the great pleasure of introducing our initial set of experts today and the co-authors of the report that we are we mentioned. And they're going to help us better understand those findings and, rec and key recommendations from that report. So first I'll introduce each of them and then they will proceed with the presentation in that order. First uh, up is Nina Jankana, a principal scientific engineering associate and assistant leader in the Sustainable Energy and Environmental Systems Department at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Her recent research focuses on techno-economic bottom-up modeling and scenario analysis of technologies and policies for accelerating clean energy transition and climate change mitigation in China and globally. She is also a contributing author to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Six Assessments, Six Assessment Reports Chapter on Mitigation and Development Pathways in the Mid to Near Term. Following Nina, we'll hear from Rishing Zhu, a Methane Policy Fellow with the California China Climate Institute. He has worked on a broad range of environmental issues such as methane control in China, air pollution, and corporate social responsibility. His areas of interest are methane emission reductions, China's decarbonization pathways, and the function of policy design in promoting sustainable economic development and joint efforts to tackle policy uh, to tackle climate change. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Nina, to get started. Great. Thank you so much, Liz, for the introduction. Um, let me get the screen. Hopefully the presentation is up and clear. So yes, thank you again, um, and I'm really excited for the opportunity to be able to give a summary of some of the key findings from our recent report with several of our co-authors on the line. And as Zhang has already mentioned um, and kind of summarized for us, you know, methane is a very important short-lived climate pollutant, and cutting methane emissions will be critical to helping reduce the impact of climate change in the near term, particularly in the next decade and two. But also, um, another point is that cutting methane emissions also has additional socioeconomic and health co-benefits, just such as improving air quality, uh, improving uh, health conditions by reducing with improved air quality and also increasing crop production. And as Zhang mentioned, the Global Methane Pledge was recently launched at COP26 and is part of a emerging group of international efforts to really focus in on addressing methane emissions um, that are rising. So 
given this kind of global context and also the critical importance of methane emissions, our report really focuses in on China and the US, which are the top first and the third largest methane emitters globally, and also look at both the opportunities as well as kind of existing challenges for achieving methane reductions in these two countries. So this chart, uh, Zhang also mentioned a little bit in terms of uh, some of the key sources of methane emissions in both the US and China. And this slide really highlights the historical methane emissions by the source sector in the US as well as China. And you'll note that the years are slightly different for the two figures with US reporting historical methane emissions up to 2021. So here we're showing the 2020 uh, composition and China's methane emissions was uh, reported for 2014 in its second biannual update to the UNFCCC back in 2019. So we can see that the composition of the sources of methane emissions are a little bit different, but also note that the total magnitude of emissions for methane in US and China are also different. And so we can see, for example, that there are some similarities as such as energy sector in both countries account for uh, about 40% or more of um, the total methane emissions, but differs in terms of the largest kind of source within the energy sector with oil and gas being the largest in the US and with coal mining being the largest in China. For the agriculture sector, it accounts for another kind of big chunk of total methane emissions um, of between 35 to 40%, depending on the country, and enteric fermentation is definitely one of the larger agricultural sources for both countries as well. So interestingly, methane also accounts for uh, over 10% of total greenhouse gas emissions for both US and China for these particular years. We also looked at the recent progress as well as some remaining challenges in terms of policy actions and the mitigation potential um, in US and China. And for the US, we noted that President Biden committed to the NDC target, which included a scope of total GHG emissions, which includes methane. And the US then in November of 2021 released a methane emission reduction action plan. And this really called for substantial reductions in US methane emissions um, resulting from updated and new rules for oil and gas infrastructure, as well as voluntary initiatives to reduce methane emissions from landfills and also climate smart agriculture programs and initiatives. Then the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022 also introduced a methane fee program for key oil and gas facilities. And at the subnational level, as you'll hear soon from Zhixing, there's also been a lot of action happening on regulating agriculture and landfill methane emissions and also different uh, policies and programs that exist uh, in both of these sectors in terms of um, focusing in on methane emissions. At the same time, however, there are still quite a few key challenges that remain, including remaining political uncertainties and the influence of um, politics on kind of regulations and some of these targets, uh, including kind of, you know, changing presidential administrations and the potential impact on policies or programs in terms of continuity. Because methane emission sources are very diverse, as we saw in the earlier pie chart, it also implies that individual strategies will need to be developed for each of these subsectors. And to some degree, there are also uh, coordination that will need to happen in terms of um, targeting the different emission sources and helping reduce the total methane emissions. And also, depending on the sector, some of the mitigation measures that are needed are still based on technologies that are in some of the earlier developmental stages and may not be fully commercialized or widely deployed yet. So that continues to be another challenge as well. For China, we've also noted a number of policy actions that's happened in the recent years, including qualitative mentions of the need to control non-CO2 greenhouse gases including specifically methane in several of the recent climate change policies, as well as China's updated NDC. And coming out of kind of uh, the US-China Joint Glasgow Declaration at COP26, China also announced that it was developing a nat national action plan on methane that is expected to be released soon. 
And then within kind of the business or industry sector in China, several of the state-owned oil and gas firms have also announced voluntary reduction targets for methane specifically. But like the U.S., there are still a number of key challenges that remain in China as well. Most of the policies and measures that have been adopted that relate to methane or reduction uh, so far are very qualitative in nature, and there is no systematic tracking and evaluation yet. And unlike for CO2, there's currently not a robust monitoring, reporting, and policy evaluation in place specifically for any of the non-CO2 greenhouse gases, including methane. And as a result, it's very difficult to evaluate the impact of some of these existing programs and policies that are related to methane mitigation. There's also a need for closer coordination between uh, methane policy and kind of overarching climate change strategy development because it is a relatively new and emerging area within climate change policy um, in China and also for financial resources to support methane policies and programs. And we noted in the literature, the kind of China specific cost estimates for a lot of these mitigation measures and technologies uh, still have a bit of a gap in it in terms of um, there are a lot of international studies that are based on uh, US or other uh, EU um, data and China specific data is, uh, not as robust as some of the other countries in terms of cost data. And so kind of on this uh, issue of cost, we did review a lot of existing literature and studies to kind of understand what is the methane reduction potential at different levels of cost and found that U.S. and China hold significant reduction potential, particularly in the U.S., uh, particularly in the energy sector. So for example, from the literature, as well as our own analysis, we were able to identify some ranges of quantitative estimates of methane reduction potential and the associated costs. But noted that um, you can see here that the baselines for comparisons are a bit different, you know, both across the studies um, and also in terms of kind of the baseline that's used, whether it's compared to 2020 or 2015 base year levels, or whether it's relative to a business as usual scenario. But regardless of these differences, we can see from the numbers that are presented here that there's over 30% of methane emission reduction potential that is, uh, tech, that is feasible at low to medium costs below US $100 per ton of CO2 equivalent by the year 2030. And we can also see particularly for the energy sector, there is significant methane reduction potential for both countries, but again, it differs in terms of which subsector of the energy sector. So for the U.S., it's really the potential is in the oil and gas sector with um, equipment modification or upgrades, changes in operational practices, and new equipment installation. Whereas for the U.S., for China, it's really in the coal mining sector in terms of uh, ventilation air VAM, as well as in terms of uh, better managing abandoned coal mines to prevent leakage. So based on this review and our analysis, uh, we identified several key opportunities for U.S. and China collaboration in the coming decade, including national level collaboration on reducing methane emissions across sectors such as developing policies and incentives to promote the implementation of mitigation measures and protocols in energy, waste, and agriculture sectors. Uh, we also identify opportunities in subnational collaboration and pilots in reducing methane emissions, again, across the same source sectors, but really sharing and exchanging information and knowledge on subnational experiences, such as uh, some of the oil and gas protocols that's been developed in the U.S. states and also some of the agricultural methane reduction measures that's been adopted in California. There's also opportunity to enhance the development of comprehensive inventory, as well as measurement reporting and verification systems through standards and protocol, and also the application and utilization of technological innovations that are emerging, such as remote sensing and analytics to help improve the robustness of data for methane. And there's also opportunity, of course, for exchange and collaboration on the development and implementation of sector-specific measures as well as programs and policies. 
And so with that, I will pause here and turn it over to my colleague Yuxin for his remarks. Um, thanks, Nina, for the presentation. Uh, it was really great. Um, and now I want I, now building on what Nina just mentioned, I want to briefly introduce some uh, methane mitigation examples in the U.S. Uh, to give you a better idea of how can we reduce those, uh, how can we solve those problems we mentioned uh, in our paper. The two mitigation examples I'm going to talk about today is about uh, solid waste methane mitigation and abandoned coal mine methane mitigation in the US. Um, so before I dig into uh, the details, I want to give you a brief overview of um, these two type of methane. Why are they uh, important and what will be the benefits we can get from mitigating them? So first of all, for solid waste methane. Um, so basically solid waste methane will be generated when the organic waste uh, decomposed in the landfills. Given the large number of landfills in uh, US and in California, this type of methane uh, accounts for 22% of California's methane emissions, and the number for the US is 17%. Uh, so as, as you can see, solid waste methane really matters uh, in the US. The benefits of solid waste methane mitigation uh, are also huge, uh, not only because it will help slow climate change in the near term, but also because uh, landfill methane is a, is a important clean energy sources and utilized landfill methane will help um, ensure an energy security. And also, um, because reducing solid waste methane sometimes require the reduction of food waste, Mitigation of solid waste methane will also help uh, reduce food insecurity. So that's about solid waste methane. As for abandoned coal mine methane, um, this type of methane will be naturally generated in coal mine. And after the coal mine was abandoned, uh, this type of the, the, the generation of this type of methane doesn't stop automatically. Given a large number of abandoned coal mines in the US, uh, 330,000 metric tons of methane was produced in the US in 2021, um, which accounts for 12.5% of all coal mining methane. Um, mitigation of this type of methane will have uh, health and environmental benefits because methane have explosive potential, and also methane is the precursor of some other types of air pollutants. Um, most importantly, mitigation of abandoned coal mine methane will foster economic development because the utilization of this type of methane will uh, create local jobs and bring more revenue to local communities, which will help uh, re re revitalize the economy in the local communities. So yeah, so after the introduction, let's dig into uh, some details about uh, how U.S. deal with these two types of methane. First, I would like to introduce uh, how California deal with solid waste methane. Um, so there are two main approaches California adopted to deal with this type of methane. The um, first approach is diverting organic waste from landfills. The purpose of this uh, approach is just to reduce meth waste methane in the first place. Uh, as as this as it is the most cost effective way to reduce the solid waste methane, um, California has been implementing regulations um, to to reduce solid waste methane. For example, it has been implementing mandatory recycling of organic waste since 2014, uh, 2014, and in 2016, California launched the Senate Bill 1383 to encourage the um, the, the the reduction of organic waste disposal in landfill. Financial support are also uh, utilized. Um, for example, procurement program uh, are utilized to uh, stimulate the demand for organic waste products in California. Uh, other types of financial supports, including fees, credits, and market expansion. Um, California did achieve something uh, through these approaches. Uh, it has successfully expanded the infrastructure of organic waste treatment, and the market for organic waste products are growing. The other approaches California has been taking uh, is reducing methane from existing landfills, and the major regulation of these approaches is the landfill methane regulation. 
Um, similar to diverting organic waste from landfills, financial mechanisms are also utilized to reduce methane from existing landfills. Um, and California has also been uh, quantifying landfill methane as well. Um, an example is that California has developed a model called California Landfill Methane Inventory Model to help estimate methane from, uh, from organic waste landfills. It has also conducted methane hotspot research by utilizing different type of technology. Uh, the direct impact of this approach is that the landfill methane emission per ton of municipal solid waste uh, decrease, has been decreasing in recent years, um, which is the good news. Uh, and now I want I would like to switch my gear a little bit and talk about how does U.S. Uh, mitigate abandoned coal mine methane. So there are three major approaches um, to reduce and utilize this type of methane. First is by uh, conducting mitigation and utilization projects. The purpose of these projects are threefold, uh, to mitigate greenhouse gas, to diversify energy portfolio, and to stimulate local economy. Various types of financial incentive and regulatory incentive have been adopted. Um, for example, large amount of, of investments was driven um, to local community to encourage the construction of these projects. And, and the cap and trade program in California uh, has also been uh, utilized to give uh, to you know incent incentivize the uh, the implementation of this project. Some states will uh, also utilize regulatory incentive. For, um, some states will offer royalty relief to methane uh, to abandoned coal mine methane utilization company. Some states will include. Um, uh, abandoned coal mine methane in their re renewable portfolio standards to give extra incentive and revenue. Interagency collaboration is uh, the second approaches that the U.S. has been taking. Um, in 1994, the coal methane outreach program was launched by the EPA to offer technical assistance to local community. In recent years, an interagency inter working group um, was established by Biden administration to leverage support from different federal departments. Um, finally, extensive engagement with local communities has been conducted throughout the nation. A great example of this is the rapid response teams, which, um, which is established for different geological area in the US to provide more targeted on the ground site-specific assistance to local co-communities. Finally, similar to um, the last example, the U.S. has been modeling and monitoring uh, uh, methane from abandoned coal mines. It has developed a model uh, for IPCC to use, and it has also included abandoned coal mine methane in its national greenhouse gas inventory. So this is a brief introduction to um, the, the, the two specific examples uh, of methane mitigation in the US. And uh, if you are interested in more de uh, information, uh, you can refer to this report that CCCI released in March. Um, and yeah, that's it. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rishin and Nina. Those are really helpful and informative presentations. Um, before we move on to our experts, I just want to remind um, folks, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom, um, and so we can get to them uh, following a few more discussions. Um, so now we're going to have two other colleagues with issue-specific expertise on methane. Um, who will provide a bit of commentary and reaction on, um, on the reports and the presentations we just heard. Uh, so I'll introduce each of, um, of our panelists here and then turn it over to them. The first is Ken Alex, who's the Director of Project Climate at the Center for Law, Energy, and the Environment at Berkeley Law. Prior to joining the Center for Law, Energy, and the Environment, uh, Ken spent eight years as a Senior Policy Advisor to Governor Jerry Brown, was director of the Governor's Office of Planning and Research and chair of the California Strategic Growth Council, focusing on climate, environment, and other land use issues. Uh, before joining the Governor's Office, Ken was the Senior Assistant Attorney General, heading the Environment Section at the California Attorney General's Office, and the co-head of the Office's Global Warming Unit. 
From 2000 to 2006, he led the California Attorney General's Energy Task Force investigating price and supply issues related to ener California's energy crisis. Ken is a graduate of Harvard Law School and holds a BA in political theory from UC Santa Cruz. And following uh, remarks from Ken, we'll hear from Dr. Raina Sway, who's an, the Assistant Research Director, Assistant Research Professor, and Assistant Research Professor at the Center for Global Sustainability at the University of Maryland School of Public Policy. Dr. Sway is an expert in global coal transition, integrated assessment modeling, and international and national climate and energy policies. She leads the Global Fossil Transition Project, and that focuses on rapid, just coal phase-out pathways, both, both globally and in key countries of interest, including China, India, Indonesia, South Africa, and others. As the China program co-director, Dr. Sway also manages the development and implementation of, C, of CGS's China program portfolio. Dr. Sway uh, also holds a joint appointment at the Joint Global Change Research Institute, a collaboration between the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory and the University of Maryland. Uh, so we look forward to hearing from both of them and we'll start with uh, Ken Alex. Okay, thank you, Louise. Thanks to all the speakers and presenters and also for an excellent report, which uh, hopefully people will have a chance to take a look at. So with the Global Methane Pledge and the US-China Joint Glasgow Agreement from the last Conference of the Parties, uh, we finally are having an opportunity for methane to get the attention that it deserves as a greenhouse gas. As the speakers said, uh, methane is hugely important and actually uh, is the biggest opportunity in the near term to, to take meaningful action to reduce climate change. So uh, the new attention is really creating opportunities for action. Um, and as usual with, with climate change and greenhouse gases, uh, it's a hugely important focus on the United States and, and on China. Uh, I think we're all awaiting uh, with anticipation the Chinese methane action plan, um, which we hope to see fairly soon. But in addition to that, there are many opportunities for action at the subnational level. Uh, and I think that's an important element that we focus on here at the Center for Law, Energy and Environment, and we don't wanna lose that point. Um, as we've heard in China, there are significant opportunities for methane emission reduction, particularly in the coal sector and the rice sector, but also from waste. And in the United States, also as we've heard, we're seeing quite a lot of focus on oil and gas sector uh, with the provisions of the new Inflation Reduction Act that uh, Nina talked about. Um, and a particular focus, th th this is really a particular focus, I think, of the, the actions uh, under the Global Methane Pledge that the US and EU are leading. So I think we're gonna see a fair amount of activity in the oil and gas sector in particular. But the US also has a good deal to do on agriculture and waste. And in this area, California, uh, as Rishan said, uh, has been really a global leader. It has uh, a requirement of 40% reduction by 2030 across all methane emission sectors and is making progress to that end. And I, I wanna very briefly give a sense of some of the things that, that we're working on here at the Center for Law, Energy and Environment that touch on all of the things that were mentioned by the presenters and in the report. Um, we're, for example, working with the UC Berkeley School of Engineering and, and other partners uh, with the idea of me measuring landfill methane emissions and the impact of interventions on those emissions with robots, drones, satellites. Uh, and what is striking uh, around landfill methane emissions in the US and, and around the world, including in China, is just how little data there is on the actual emissions from those landfills. We know it's significant, 
their estimates of how much it is, but for any particular landfill, we don't have a lot of data. And so we're hoping working with the engineering school uh, that we'll be able to fill some of that gap. Um, and uh, there's no reason that we can't try the same approach in China and we're actively uh, reaching out to see if there's some possible partnerships to do so. We're also working with an entity here in the United States called the Institute for Governance and Sustainable Development um, to, to look for uh, opportunities in China. And we have a little funding to do some of that outreach. We are uh, following a bill in uh, the state legislature here in California called SB 781. It's working its way through the, uh, through the legislative process, but it would institute a low emission natural gas standard, which would identify sources of natural gas with, uh, with less than 0.2% uh, emissions overall from, from uh, the natural gas uh, production process and would require California to only import low emission gas. And that could have an impact ar around the US. Um, we're also working uh, with California and others to develop protocols for inventorying sources of methane emissions in different jurisdictions, incorporating satellite data, building a system uh, to notify, uh, and building a system to notify facilities where leaks have been identified. Um, that is not such an easy task. Uh, and as Nina mentioned, uh, systematic tracking and monitoring is really not uh, being done on, in the methane world, uh, certainly as much as CO2, but just uh, objectively not being done as much as it, as it really needs to be done. And if you think about it, it's not so easy. Um, for example, as noted, enteric emissions from livestock are a very significant source of emission in California and, and in the US and around the world, but that requires evaluating numbers of livestock and, and the types of emissions that come from livestock. Uh, for rice, uh, we can identify most of the rice fields uh, in the world, but uh, determining when they're flooded and when they're not, which has quite a significant impact on uh, emissions, uh, is much more difficult. And for oil and gas, uh, we know uh, that the estimates for emission uh, for methane are significantly underestimated, and we need to figure out exactly why that is and, and how to deal with it. We can improve on, on all of that uh, in a way uh, we hope that can be implemented jurisdiction by jurisdiction around the world, and then have a, 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 a process when leaks are detected. As we know, there's going to be a lot of uh, methane satellite detection activity coming soon. What do we do with that data, and how do we get facilities to respond when we find leaks? So there's a great deal to do. Uh, a lot of it is identified in, in the report that uh, Rishan and Nina just described, and we hope to continue to work uh, with them and, and with everybody in, in China and, and the U.S. to, to make further progress. And I think I will stop there and turn it over to Dr. Sway. Yeah, thank you, Ken. Um, and also thank you, Louise, for the intro earlier. Um, I first want to congrats to all the uh, co-authors and uh, the team on delivering the US-China collaboration uh, methane report, uh, but also the whole series. I think it's we all know it is very important for US-China to continue collaborate um, in the climate uh, uh, space. And this has been demonstrated a great leadership previously, uh, uh, kind of a, ahead of the Paris Agreement that's uh, really successful. So I think this whole series, um, it will be uh, very great uh, information and resources for all the um, research and also policy community. So really wanna congrats to the team. Um, so I, also, thank you for the opportunity to uh, provide some comments. Um, I think it's actually very much in line with uh, all the spe uh, speakers already said. 
Um, I, I do have uh, uh, two slides, which is very short. I want to uh, kind of uh, share um, to help uh, provide a little bit more um, detail about uh, some of my comments. I also want to start by saying the methane topic now is very important, especially this year. There are a lot of uh, uh, discussion around the global stock take. It is an important year. And the topic about whether we are on track, I think that's not very positive, but I think uh, how we can keep global 1.5 degree alive, it is still on the table. And there is um, a lot of potential that can be achieved uh, through the near term that also mentioned by Ken and others uh, by maximizing uh, the potential on methane and other non-CO2 uh, mitigation um, through different uh, measures. Oh. Sorry. Um, so this chart uh, from a recent paper published by some of our uh, colleagues um, uh, from our team is really show different uh, two different pathway. With one, the blue line is really CO two only driven um, a strategy, uh, where you you do have a, a, a some methane non CO two reduction because we're uh, doing fuel switching from fossil fuel to others. Uh, but if we incorporate a comprehensive strategy um, that do have more targeted uh, measures, including you know reduce the uh, uh, leakages and also cover all the other sectors, um, um, including industrial processes with methane, um, those are actually can uh, have a, a threefold effects. First, you can see we can achieve a earlier peaking temperature um, that's uh, moved from the blue line to the orange line. And we can also achieve a, a reduction in the uh, peaking warming uh, by uh, 0.1 degrees. Um, and also the uh, reduction in the end of the century warming will be uh, even larger by 0.3 degrees. So this is really show um, an opportunity where kind of a, a, a uh, 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 how we can still keep global 1.5 alive. Um, that uh, really should be the focus of this year and thinking about the, the uh, opportunities after we um, end up with a, a not too positive uh, global stock take. Um, so after that kind of a broader framing, uh, I also want to kind of a comment on the uh, U.S.-China leadership. Um, I think that's uh, very um, uh, kind of a much uh, uh, agreed on the uh, topic. Uh, methane uh, has emerged as a new focal area for U.S.-China cl climate collaboration that's been recognized uh, in both the recent policy progress in both countries, uh, but also the uh, joint Glasgow declaration. Um, I uh, I think uh, I kind of organized some of the collaboration areas um, that are already uh, uh, emphasized by the speaker and in the report. Um, and actually, we also uh, led some work last year um, between uh, U.S. and China researchers, including uh, some of the colleagues from LBN um, on this effort uh, to really explore um, kind of around the inventory issue, the mitigation issue, the policy issues around the methane topic. Um, so I think I organized uh, some of the uh, bullet points around what are the you know, the key challenges that U.S. China can work together, which are not unique to the two countries, actually can, you know, provide a lot of uh, uh, experience and uh, example uh, for other countries as well. Uh, but also some of the more positive opportunities that we should, you know, think about leveraging and uh, uh, navigate. Uh, so start from the challenges, I think also mentioned um, the huge uncertainty in terms of emission inventory um, that do require uh, a lot of uh, uh, technology and also uh, uh, policy um, kind of a, a, a improvement that we can get our better uh, data, uh, both in terms of quality, but also the granularity, um, which means we want uh, a more uh, site specific or location specific data um, in terms of like a emission factor or kind of a better understand what are, uh, what are the uh, magnitude of the emissions. So that can uh, both uh, uh, require collaboration or uh, uh, on technology and also the MRV schemes that both countries can uh, work on together. And the second bullet is about the mitigation costs and potential, and again, kind of emphasized by, by the effort uh, uh, presented already. Um, there are 
the uh, Nina mentioned kind of the, the you know, the, the China specific uh, uh, mag curves, there are uncertainty. So really we want to understand how much um, are some of the uh, site specific uh, uh, technology options, uh, but also when we can actually implement uh, implement them. So that's another, uh, I think, huge um, unexplored or unanswered question that needs need to have more kind of a field uh, data collection or kind of understanding um, that both countries can work together. Um, the third bullet I put on the policy gaps. Um, this is actually, if you look at the chart on the right, um, this is a, a, a policy mapping between the two countries. Uh, you can uh, probably too small for the for the for the font, but the rows are the different policy instrument, and the columns are the different uh, sector or subsector. So there are. Um, you know, the gaps in terms of both the sector coverage, but also like what type of policy instruments we're uh, utilizing. So there are a lot of, um, you know, experience sharing, lessons sharing that the two countries can, can do together uh, to fill in those uh, policy gaps. So move on the opportunity side. I think there are... Uh, uh, some low-hanging fruit sectors um, that also mentioned by the presenter, kind of on the energy sector side, on the waste sector side, um, those can be prioritized in the near term, uh, which actually have a, a higher readiness for, for collaboration, um, like especially on uh, thinking about the coal mine there uh, uh, is a long history of, uh, although smaller scale collaboration, but it, it have a lot of uh, groundwork already. Um, and second bullet also uh, very much agreed um, things on, on, on beyond the climate change benefits, on the air quality, public health, uh, safety issue, security issue. Um, those are deliver a lot of uh, additional motivation uh, for, for, uh, for, uh, for, for higher ambition for both country. And that's um, uh, very much uh, in line with um, the, the uh, authors are, are, are mentioning. And I think the, the third and fourth bullet are kind of related, um, the subnational non-state collaboration between the two country. Um, both country have uh, uh, some really um, kind of high emitting region, but also super emitters. Uh, they are uh, making a, a, a high impact, but also if we're targeting though, uh, target uh, having some more targeted action, they can deliver a large outcome as well. And there is a, a lot of uh, potential, like California is a great example for, for those subnational collaboration. Um, and I think our uh, analysis in the US also show when we integrating all the subnational action back into you know, the national ambition actually provide a more robust and also uh, higher confidence for the, uh, for the country to make uh, more ambitious target or commitment. Um, so I think with that, I will end my comment and uh, uh, congrats again to uh, all the authors. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Reina and Ken. That was really um, helpful additional context for the conversation. Um, I would like to remind folks who are online, please post your questions in the Q&A box and we, will, um, we can answer those. Uh, and we should have plenty of time for questions now. Um, so maybe I will kick it off to get the conversation started. Um, and uh, Maybe I think we've heard a lot about the potential um, for collaboration and really near-term actions that that we can be taking. And so, I wonder if um, if some of you could speak to actions that have been underway in California that you think have been particularly effective that we can lift up and could be a model for other jurisdictions. Uh, and then maybe we can turn to China um, about some of the demonstrations of success on the ground there. So who would like to take that question? Rishing. Um, well, speaking of the uh, collaboration, I think uh, if, if, you speak, if you think about the format, I think uh, the a memoranda of understanding is a, is a good ch ch um, choice. Um, so because uh, right now California is, uh, collaborating with the Ministry of Ecology and Environment in China to conduct a series of collaboration in different sectors. Um, and I think this type of government to government level dialogue will help a lot to, you know, com communicate the solutions from different, uh, from different jurisdictions 
um, and you know there there are lots of mutual learning opportunities there. So yeah. Great. Are there specific um, actions that California has been taken that you or has taken that you think uh, via the MOU, you know, we can sort of share that experience um, and and vice versa, things that have been happening in China? Um, I think I. So for now, I think the dialogue is the most important one. Like uh, the gar the government members from both jurisdictions stand, uh, sit down and talk to each other. Um, I think nothing works better than that uh, at this stage. And in the future, maybe we can do some collaborative research together. Um, yeah. John? Hi, Luis. Um, as we were preparing that, um, the summary on the California experience in waste sector ethnic education, it become pretty clear that that's a particularly productive area for collaboration because every city has to deal with their landfill issues. Um, in, in California, the challenges are very clear, and we have some delays in implementing our regulations. But you know, once it start, is actually have a tremendous um, success in reducing uh, the green waste, food waste uh, diverted to uh, landfills. In China, and you know the scarcity of land is a major, major issue. So most cities are facing severe challenges in you know, limiting, um, uh, expanding their landfill. In fact, uh, China has launched a zero waste cities program across roughly a hundred cities um, by 2025. You know, that's a huge amount of space to work together to figure out uh, as well. Uh, and also in terms of environmental justice issues, Oftentimes, those landfills are sited in areas near less advantaged communities with tremendous air pollution issues as well. Yeah, so I think and only tackling the greenhouse gas aspect of the methane emission, but also in terms of improving air quality, improving the livelihood of the community who are nearby landfills is also a major opportunity. Ken? Yeah, I'll mention uh, a couple of things that California is doing that I think uh, are, are, is relevant. One is um, they've instituted a lot of dairy digesters in the uh, livestock sector. And it can be a little bit controversial because um, it, it may result in more confined animal feeding operation density um, because that that's uh, a wet manure, um, but it has been effective in capturing methane gas from manure. Um, sticking with livestock for a second, California has uh, spent a lot of time and effort looking at uh, feed additives, and there's a lot of work being done at UC Davis, uh, particularly around things like red seaweed and, and some other possibilities that seem to have a good deal of potential to reduce uh, emissions from livestock. Um, one thing that California has done that I, you know, uh, is sort of precursor to the satellite data that I think is going to be quite extensive in the next few months is to have airplane overflights using a, a detection instrument on the, on the airplane. Um, and that gets to uh, Raina's point about uh, super emitters. California has identified through those overflights uh, a number of uh, sources, facilities uh, of super emission. Um, and because methane is colorless and odorless, the facilities don't necessarily know that they have significant leaks. Um, and California's experience is when those facilities were notified, they actually, in a number of instances, were actually able to stop the leak and were appreciative of, of being able to do so. We're hoping to be able to replicate that with satellite data. There will be a number of new satellites at the end of this year, the beginning of next year, and that uh, could provide jurisdictions all over the world, including in the US and China, with some additional data. One thing that California is doing on that 
uh, to, to prepare for that is to get a, a list of, of facilities and contacts so that when that data becomes available and if there's information about leaks, they have the ability to contact those responsible. And we'd very much like to see that replicated uh, in China and elsewhere. I think it's a really good model. Um, and I'll mention one other thing. Uh, California is doing quite a lot, but there, uh, as was noted in the presentation, California has quite a lot of uh, oil wells, some of which are orphaned uh, and is going through in a, in a rigorous way to try to figure out how to plug uh, and close those wells so that they don't leak. Um, and I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, well, maybe I'll turn now to a question from one of our attendees um, of whether there are specific collaborative projects, either joint research or joint implementation on coal mine methane that are going on now. Uh, given the amount of coal mine methane in the US, is there any work going on that Chinese scientists are or could be invited to join? Um, I know there's a long history of uh, EPA kind of a, a supported and also joint um, effort on uh, China coal mine methane since the 1990s, probably. Um, but I, I don't have a kind of a list of concrete project at hand right now. Uh, but I'm sure there are, um, you know, a lot of um, ongoing um, uh, collaboration in that area. Um, but I think the the really potential is kind of expanding that. Um, uh, a collaboration with more uh, uh, stakeholders or partners. Um, I do also think the um, uh, research collaboration, it's um, another very key element that's um, kind of a, uh, going on as well. Um, uh, thinking about the, the um, um, uh, joint research to better understand the opportunity in e each country. Um, yeah, but yeah, sorry, I don't have kind of a more concrete information on that. Um, uh, yeah, feel free others even know more. Thank you. Anyone want to add anything on that? I was going to mention the, the US EPA work, but I was not familiar with anything else either. So I can add a little bit. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. The, I, I remember the report that um, Rena just mentioned. Like, I, I, yeah, I also remember US EPA has, long, has released a report about uh, mitigating abandoned coal mine methane in Shanxi province in China. Um, I think that's the on, that that's the only collaboration between EPA and China, as far as I know, on coal mine methane. Um, and I mean, it, and I I have an idea about the future collaboration uh, area, uh, which is um, to incorporate abandoned coal mine methane mitigation into a large policy framework that encompass not only abandoned coal mine methane mitigation, but also environmental protection, um, abandoned mine land reclamation, and economic development. Uh, well, actually, that is what U.S. is doing right now. Um, U.S. is utilizing abandoned coal mine methane mitigation as an important tool to, uh, as an important tool to, you know, um, address the environmental hazards around abandoned coal mines and you know develop local economy i think that i think that's something that chinese can try to do as well um because because this can not only because uh if we do if we mitigate abandoned coal mine methane in this uh, comprehensive way we not only utilize abandoned coal mine methane as a clean energy source but we can also uh, you know, make a, we can also make a sustainable and just transition of local economy to make sure that um, those people who are historically affected by coal mines can really can really benefit from um, the transition of the energy structure. Um, yeah. Great, thank you, Rishing. Um, and I know there was a follow up question around whether there is any current US EPA work. Um, the last I spoke, which has probably been a, about a year ago, there was still some voluntary partnership happening. Um, but I don't know, Reina, if you're aware of the current status of that work. Yeah, I, I think um, there, 
probably not in in terms of um, uh, uh, concrete projects. I mean, I, I don't have the knowledge about the concrete project, but I know there are still at least in terms of conversation and maybe joint discussion. Um, that's definitely happening um, kind of on, on the EPA side um, with China. Um, yeah, but kind of the concrete project, probably there is a um, kind of a gap now. Mm -hmm. Luis, I, I'm not aware of any uh, ongoing EPA project, um, but we are, as scholars uh, who are interested in this issue, always welcome our Chinese colleague, both for a research exchange and joint project, and then also come for, for a visit, uh, especially at UC Berkeley, where uh, mm -hmm. we're uh, open arms. Yes. Yes, we're really happy to be able to start doing that exchange again um, in person and invite visitors to come. Uh, another question, I'm not sure if anyone has looked at this topic, so I will ask it, which, um, and, but feel free to, to we can, we can um, try to find additional information later if we don't have the answer now, which is, does China have a set of best practices on how to reduce methane emissions from water reservoirs? I can speak quickly to that. Um, that wasn't an area of focus in our report. Um, and I think it's because it's, you know, very new kind of methane in general. So as far as we understand, I think China has been mostly focusing in on some of those larger key emitting sectors that we showed in our earlier chart. Um, so I think they're kind of really digging deeper into each of those sectors and trying to identify and also learn from international best practices in terms of what are some options for mitigating uh, methane emissions, whether it's the technologies, the measures, you know, policies, programs um, that have been adopted globally and are kind of really focusing in on those. Um, so it seems like there's been some academic literature published looking at methane emissions from reservoirs, uh, including particularly related to hydropower. But as far as we've seen, there hasn't been any uh, further development kind of on looking at potential for mitigating methane emissions for water reservoirs. Um, because as I said, it's, uh, you know, methane is a very new topic uh, related to climate change in China. And I think a lot of the focus is on kind of those low hanging fruit that we discuss, uh, you know, many of our speakers speak to. So I think this is probably an even newer area within that realm. So they haven't, as far as we know, haven't looked too much into that area yet. Thank you. Um, if there, are, I invite folks to please continue to, if you have questions, put them in the Q and A. But maybe I will um, ask one uh, in the interim, which is, uh, we've heard discussion of, you know, Cal, or sorry, China's development of their methane action plan. I was wondering if any of you could speak to how um, uh, China is looking and, and planning to mitigate methane through the five year plan. Is that something that you all have looked at and can speak to? to how that has, uh, how methane emissions have come up there. Um, maybe I can just offer um, what do I observe or heard uh, so far, uh, Luis. I think the China's draft um, national plan on methane mitigation is being finished, right? It's going through the interagency review process, you know, dealing with comment from different agencies. I mean, we're looking all looking forward to seeing that um, being announced uh, soon. I hope that the recent discussion between U.S. and China has opened up more space for dialogue and collaboration on this set of issues. Uh, in China's current uh, announced uh, five-year plans, there are specific mentions reducing now CO2 greenhouse gases which include methane uh, in the even, you know, in certain sector uh, five-year plan, they mentioned they shall control emission of methane emission for sure. Uh, in coal mine methane issues, and there is actually existing standards requiring um, Chinese coal mines to address at least high concentration methane emissions in all coal mines. That, in fact, that was a, a standard dated back in 2008. I, I think there's action now to revise uh, that standard. We're looking forward to see any you know, public study that document and progress on that issues. Great, thank you. Um, 
We've been focusing a lot of our discussion um, so far this evening on China, the US and California. I wonder if any of you could speak to the role of international collaborations like the Global Methane Hub um, in helping to address uh, methane emissions and the role that they can play um, as, as we really try to accelerate emission reductions. Uh, I'm sure all of us have some ideas. Uh, again, please uh, uh, jump in. I know you're in close dialogue with them as well. Just in terms of broader collaboration, I think we all recognize there are certain mitigation measures that are mature. Uh, we know, and we know the cost. We can do it right away. I think getting those implemented today uh, would build the confidence and show people how they can be done. This is particularly true in oil and gas field uh, sector. Many of the Chinese oil and gas majors have signed on to national industry voluntary initiatives. So that's clearly a very positive area for, for all of all countries, including US China to move forward on. Uh, there are also areas, things are difficult, right? You know, mitigation measure are limited. The costs are pretty high and we, we, we don't know how to deal with them completely yet. It's particularly in agriculture, I think can mention some of the initiative in terms of exploring new opportunities uh, in you know food additive for for uh, enteric fermentation right? that can really benefit for much greater investment by all countries who uh, have have addressed the issues uh, as we know that the there is an economy scale right Even more people invest in that innovation uh, the speed of uh, change will accelerate that would benefit everyone uh, I would say that you know in many of the new technology area whether it's sort of PV and other technologies, much greater global investment would actually reduce in costs for every single consumer and company as well. I think that's also another areas for a possible collaboration. Um, I'll jump in with a with a couple of, of things. Um, you know, the the global methane hub uh, I'm sorry, the Global Methane Pledge um, doesn't have, it, it's pretty much voluntary, but there's a move now to try to create a secretariat for the, for the pledge countries. And I think that that will institutionalize some of the response. Meanwhile, you identified the Global Methane Hub, which is a, a compilation of, of foundation and funders um, really focused on methane. And you know that has the potential to scale things. Um, you know, I, and I think that the satellites have the potential to really drive scale and coordination if if countries and subnational governments are willing. We'll we'll have to see because we haven't we haven't had that yet. But there's going to be a, a whole lot of data about leakage and the sources and the facilities and um, the, the potential to move quickly will be significantly increased if there's coordination and cooperation. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll see a lot more activity um, coordinated and, and uh, working together over the next few months when the satellite data becomes more available. Raina? Yeah, also very quickly, I think on the Global Methane Pledge, um, while it's voluntary, I think there also is a collective target that doesn't, you know, put anything on individual country, but it's still the 30% kind of a give a um, kind of inofficial standard when you, you know, thinking about how countries are perf performing around their method mitigation. So I think that's very helpful when you uh, trying to navigate, like, what are the space for, for um, kind of actions and, you know, mobilize some of the potential. Um, another uh, thing I want to mention quickly is the uh, also uh, uh, came out of last COP, um, a new initiative support by the U.S. State Department and also Bloomberg Philanthropy on a subnational 
national um, kind of a network. It's called a scale, uh, Subnational Climate Action Leaders Exchange. Uh, so that have a first year focus on uh, waste sector methane, and they have um, uh, making network uh, among several uh, 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 city uh, level leaders um, to think about, you know, there's a broader um, uh, so a societal benefits on think, uh, uh, managing waste sector methane. So those including India, Indonesia, Mexico as kind of the first year effort. So just want to see uh, say kind of the international definitely there, there are a lot of uh, very exciting uh, activities going on. Thank you. And I think that's a really important point, which is the important role that we do you know, for subnational and national governments and cooperation at all scales. And this is so important. Um, so we only have a few minutes left, uh, but I wanted to see if we can quickly address a question that just popped up in the Q&A um, on more on the technical side, which is uh, regarding the proposed updates to in the Environmental Protection Agency's GHG reporting. Um, does anyone have a perspective on the importance or benefit of using global warming potential 20 for methane emission uh, emission inventories? Any quick thoughts on that? Um, Maybe I not can, a topic well, anyone's looked at yeah. closely yet. <laughs> Well, I am definitely not a kind of a climate modeler, um, but also kind of a can, can try. I, I feel like the global warming potential um, could be. I, I I think that methodology overall, and also like the the um, uh, the the framing around it, can be um, you know giving or like a wrong interpretation of some of the results. So I think the the um, uh, in all the IPCC or kind of the IPCC database that uh, provided by um, kind of the uh, global integrated assessment models, um, those are uh, using approach that not using the uh, CO2 equivalent based on global warming potential, but it's more like having a simplified uh, climate model that you can actually look at the uh, 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 climate forcing of individual uh, uh, emission species that have a you know more accurate um, analysis of the temperature um, so I think that that's a, 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 a full force, uh, you know, national analysis or national modeling that could be challenging, like without that. So kind of a, the translation with global warming potential, it's being used in that way. Um, yeah, but I, I feel like we should be uh, uh, cautious about, you know, understanding some of the results based on the global warming potential. Others are using direct kind of a, a climate forcing analysis. Yeah, but that's the only, you know, thing I, I know, but nothing more detail beyond that. Great. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for squeezing that last question in. Um, we're reaching the end of our time uh, this evening and this morning. I want to say a, a huge thank you to our panelists and discussants um, for the conversation and presentations tonight. It was really informative and helpful. Thank you to our audience who joined us. Um, and just a reminder, this event has been recorded and will be available on the California China Climate Institute website and YouTube channel. Um, and so thank you everyone for joining us today. I hope everyone has a lovely evening and a lovely day. Um, we look forward to seeing you at future uh, webinars. Thank you.